Just uh, to introduce Ramat Beheshti, uh, who's uh, a postdoc fellow at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, who's uh, being considered for a faculty position in the, at the BTCRI Center for Transformational Research on Health Behavior. Dr. Beheshti received his bachelor's degree in computer science software engineering from Kamarzai University in Tehran, his master's in artificial intelligence at the Iran University of Science and Technology. He has a PhD in computer science from the University of Central Florida. Since 2015, Dr. Paheshti has been a postdoctoral trainee researcher in the education and training program at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health in the International Health Department and, uh, and a joint uh, training at the, the Wagner School of Engineering Applied Math and Statistics Department. He is first author on, on two book chapters and six published manuscripts in a variety of journals, including uh, those as the Journal of Nutrition and PLOS One. He has received uh, several uh, awards and fellowships, including the Graduate Research Excellence Fellowship. And in 2015, he was the first runner-up among 132 PhD students for the University of Central Florida Computer Science Doctoral Student of the Year. Since then, he continues to develop uh, interesting research ideas, some of which I'm sure we'll hear about today. Uh, the overall theme of Dr. Beheshti's research has been his effort to apply his strong computational background in studying different factors that affect health outcomes, including biological, social, and environmental factors. He believes there are unique opportunities to explore new ways of applying analytical and computational techniques to study health problems. Please help me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Beheshti. Working. Is it working now? Okay, sounds fine. Okay, uh, thank you for, very much for inviting me and thank you very much for coming to my presentation. It's really an honor to be here, uh, probably on the last day of the winter here. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks again to come to my talk. So probably I can skip my first slide of presentation, there is pretty much nothing that I have to say, except that I do not have a PhD in epidemiology or neuroscience. I have a PhD in computer science, and then I was trained in the area of public health for entering the four, fourth year now. And the way that I want to start my presentation is that uh, we might be really good at making advanced robots and high-tech space shuttles, but we also know that we still have a very hard time to understand our own basic behaviors. So that could be as simple as sleeping or eating, or it could be more complex scenarios like binge eating or addictive or compulsive behaviors like smoking and video game playing. And if we could possibly come up with a way to actually understand the decision-making processes that lead to this type of health behaviors, we can come up with much better prevention and treatment for this type of health conditions. So one thing that we know for sure is that they are not a result of only biology. There is a whole different factors that contribute to this type of health conditions, uh, from environmental factors, economic factors, media, uh, social networks, even policy at the national or international level, all of them affect our behaviors. So then the big question here is that, is there a way actually to understand these health behaviors by combining all of those different factors that contribute to our health behaviors? And it, I mean, similar to many other fields, uh, modeling has been sh shown to be a very effective way to do that, and specifically what I call complex models. So they are coming from the areas of system science and complex systems, and specifically the type of methods that are being studied in this area, system science and complex systems, which I'm going to spend more time in my presentation. The way that they treat the, pro the problem, they attack the problem, is that, is that by the so-called, as you might have heard of it, systems thinking, kind of having a holistic view of the problem instead of looking at every component of the problem. So 
because remember we are dealing with quite complex problems that are very hard to understand and uh, they are able to actually fuse all of these data sets that can actually show every factor uh, that actually affect our behavior and they can function as both predictive and prescriptive models in a way that they can actually be used for kind of predicting the outcome of a kind of a system or having a better understanding of the system to be used for what if scenarios, for example, in policy making scenarios or in a kind of health system, a biological system, to have a better understanding of how the whole system is working. I know it's too abstract, but I think in the presentation that will become clear what I mean by this type of approaches. So basically, this is my background through my graduate study and my postdoc. I was working on the projects that involve using similar techniques to study health behaviors, specifically in the area of smoking for my PhD and obesity for all my postdoc. So I'm going to cover four of the major projects that I have been involved. Obviously, I won't be able to go to nuts and bolts of every one of them. Uh, I'm going to cover only one of them in more detail, but feel free to ask any question about the remaining three, and I will be happy to answer any uh, extra details that might be needed, any, any question that you might have about them. So let me start with the first project that was related to my work in my PhD. So basically, it was a four or five, uh, three, four years of project. Uh, back in my PhD, University of Central Florida, uh, Orlando, which was a kind of really huge uh, university kind of compared to Virginia Tech somehow. So we had about 50,000 students on the campus. They started to become so-called a smoke-free campus. And that was a unique opportunity for us to actually study the role of specifically uh, social norms uh, on the smoking behaviors of the individuals. So they started their intervention on the year 2012, and we had access to some data before and one year after this intervention. And I developed a model to simulate smoking behaviors of the students. And the core part of this model was a, a normative structure. So basically, they are actually coming from an area called normative multi-agent systems uh, in the area of artificial intelligence. So they have many, many applications to actually apply social norms ideas to simulation or to coordination. For example, autonomous driving or uh, even like uh, other kind of robot interactions. They use some kind of social norms ideas. But in this case, it's used for simulation. And I think it's kind of a quite easy sometimes to forget how important are social norms to determine our daily life. For example, just imagine the way that I am standing in front of you, the way that you are sitting right now, all of them are somehow indirectly affected by the social norms that we agreed to follow. So they also have a great uh, influence on health behaviors, being a smoking and other type of behaviors. So, I borrowed a kind of uh, architecture for, uh, or a theory from psychology that actually determines three phases of recognizing a norm, adapting to a norm, and complying to the norm for a norm to actually emerge in a society. And I mapped it to the area of smoking in a kind of simulated world where actually in the recognizing phase, the beliefs of people might be changing the number of cigarettes might be changing in the adaption phase for each individual, and compliance is similar to quitting in this case. I mapped it to this area, and obviously there are possibilities to go back each phase and have relapse, and that's, I, I think, is clear. And uh, to, in a kind of technical word, I used a numerical range from zero to 100 and two thresholds for each individual to determine where that person is located within this range. So, and there are actually several data sets that we use from health services from the campus, uh, from an app that I, we designed it ourselves. We gave it that to the students. They recorded their location, reported that back to us. We also, I also designed a survey myself. We had a really good participation rate and asked about their behavior, behavior of the students. And 
we developed that model using the data from the year 2012, and the model then was compared against uh, one year after that, 2013. I'm showing you one set of the results. This is after one year of simulation. We can see, for example, here the percentage of smoker students, which is relatively low from what you can expect, but that is the data that was given to us. This is the kind of this, what simulation was doing. And also kind of comparing the number of individuals interested to attend a smoke quitting classes. We had a way of actually calculating that in the simulation. But the idea was that we were able to actually simulate very similar patterns to reality. And when you have such a model, there are so many applications that you can have with such a model, which I'm going to come back to it to in other projects that I will present. Coming to my uh, postdoc, the remaining projects are all related to the area of obesity. Again, uh, being interested to how, to how actually social connections, social network can affect behavior of individuals. So one thing that we know, uh, obesity, like uh, probably any other health behavior, is contagious. And what I mean by obesity is like behaviors related to obesity, food intake and physical activity. So we know that the, the way that uh, your parents, your colleague, uh, your actually friends, they consume food or they go to gym, all of them actually affect your own behavior. So now that we know obesity is contagious, one of the classic questions is that, uh, so I think we all know in this room that uh, in area of public health, in the area of medicine, uh, we are all concerned about designing effective interventions to improve the quality of life of our population, right? So then a big question is that if I want to design an intervention in the area of obesity, is it actually worth to actually come, uh, uh, go ahead and uh, collect social network data and then uh, target individuals based on their social structure on the network? And if is it worth, then how those individuals have to be have to be determined. So in order to answer that question, I developed a model uh, using a famous data set. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. And basically, they uh, actually recorded the behavior of uh, several thousand uh, youth individuals uh, back in 80s and 90s, their uh, body weight, actually food intake, their lab experiment. So we developed a model which was able to actually represent the same similar patterns of weight change for that period, for a couple of decades. We made sure that the model is working realistically. Then we went ahead and actually uh, experiment. We had experiments to show the effectiveness of the uh, simulated interventions. So this is one of the simulated interventions, in this case on physical activity. So 10% of the population in all simulated uh, world receive uh, an intervention on physical activity increased by 17%. And by the way, all of those numbers are brought from the uh, rigorous literature. They are not meaningless numbers. So they are kind of close to what you would see in a real intervention on the real field. So, and then we have 10% of the population, imagine 1,000 population, we have 100 of them uh, uh, chosen for receiving this intervention. Then we compare different ways of actually choosing those 10 percentage. So you can see here at the very top, so this is, by the way, a simulation over two years or 700 days of simulation after receiving the intervention. And what is compared is the average body weight of the entire population. So here, actually, a lower is better. So here on top, you can see baseline. If there is no intervention, you would actually expect that the average amount of body weight will continue to slowly grow. And then we compare it against traditional methods. Uh, this one is randomly targeting individuals and high-risk individuals, in this case meaning uh, people who had high BMI. Comparing that with two uh, network-based methods, in this case, I'm showing, uh, actually the risk was longer, but I'm showing two of them. So this one is centrality based, and I'm sure many of you are familiar, but this one was actually degree centrality, which basically means if you have no more number of connections, more number of friends, if you will, there is a higher prob probability that you will be chosen for receiving that uh, intervention. And then comparing that to another uh, area of influence maximization, 
which in the area of social network analysis, specifically computational studies, it is a whole area of research by itself. So the idea is with many applications in the area of marketing, advertisement. So the idea is that how can I Im uh, actually maximize the influence of an advertisement to actually, when I want to spend, uh, target X number of individuals. So the idea is very comparable to what we want to do, but there are actually algorithms because the problem itself is quite hard. There are algorithms to do it in a realistic way. Uh, so we applied those ideas to area of obesity, I think for one of the very kind of first uh, research groups to do that. And this is the, uh, actually when we use those kind of uh, methods for influence maximization, what we observed was that a network-based methods were actually doing much better job than traditional methods. For this one, I'm actually only showing uh, confidence interval for the remaining. I didn't show it, but they are not overlapping. I just want to make it the chart actually nicer. And one, one thing that was really exciting for us, uh, uh, specifically for me, coming from a kind of a non-traditional area, was that after a year of publishing this work, we were contacted by a European uh, group from Netherlands, and they asked us for the code of this model to actually use it for the real field, to actually determine the individuals because they already had the network data from their kind of community. They just want to kind of use a model to determine which one is the best for them to be used. So that was quite an exciting moment for us. So moving forward, the, another project uh, that we were working was related to the area of the role of price in food decision making. I think it's kind of clear and needless to say the price of the food is a major Determinant of, determinant of the food that we choose. And when it comes to low-income individuals, that's obviously much more important. So one of the classic questions in this specific area is that which price metrics do the individuals use for uh, food decision making? And specifically, there are three price metrics, price per calorie, price per gram, and price per serving that people in the field have identified. And I'm going to come back to the question of why this question is so important and why does it matter, actually, uh, later. But for now, I'm, and by the way, price per calorie is just the number of dollars that you spend on the amount of calorie that you consume and price per gram and price per serving similarly. So these are metrics for food decision making. So, um, uh, but for now, I just want to kind of briefly mention that, uh, for example, on food assistance programs like SNAP, there is a huge amount of money, as everyone here knows, going toward this kind of program at the state or uh, federal level. So knowing which price metric individuals use has a direct impact on determining which category of food you will choose for allocating your food assistance money. Uh, and I'm going to kind of make it that more clear uh, but actually to answer this question, uh, which is a kind of a very important question in the area of nutrition, I came up with the idea that uh, let's just make a simulation of the real individuals and have them choose their food by following each of those price metrics, price per calorie, price per gram, and price per serving, which collectively I'm showing with PPX, to just refer to three of them and then compare the generated patterns against the real data, and we will see whether there is any meaningful conclusion that we can make. So the technique that I have used in this uh, model, similar to the previous one, was called agent-based modeling. And probably many of you are familiar with that, uh, but the idea is kind of simple. It's not that hard. Uh, so imagine that you want to make a simulation of a city or individuals, I just want to make it specific to in humans, but in general agents could be anything, it could be cells or anything. But in this case, imagine that you want to make a simulation of a city, what you would do is that you actually simulate the individuals as agents and you might actually define a set of attributes for them, in this case it could be demographical actually attributes and then a set of behavioral rules for your simulation for them to follow and decide about their behavior, which means that uh, they have to be located within an environment to actually decide about their decision. So this is kind of like a SimCity type of thing that you make to actually study, study your problem, in this case a kind of health problem. And 
the real strength of this type of techniques, which is probably the most popular techniques, technique in the area of complex system, is that they actually treat the problems in a kind of bottom-up approach. So, uh, so because these are quite complex problems when we deal them at the kind of high level, at the population level, the idea is that it's very hard for us to come with anything almost. You cannot come up with a mathematical, a statistical model that can describe the population level food decision making of the whole US population or entire world. It's very hard to do that, right? So the idea is that I actually focus on the kind of individuals, on the things that I know for sure, for example, simple rules that govern their behavior, and I let them kind of interact with each other, with the environment, and then what happens is that at the top level, quite uh, counterintuitive and nonlinear patterns generally arise. So that's the method that we use for this model. And so basically, the agents were representative of the US population. And they had a set of attributes, personal attributes, and food budget for each individual, and diet composition. And in this case, environment that we need them to decide was price of the food. So we have individuals, they decide about the food based on the price of the food available to them. So to just give you more details, the individuals were representative of US adult population over age of 20. Uh, and the data was brought from uh, the census data for the year 2001. And every data that you will see belongs, uh, relates to the year 2001, because we wanted to ha have all of them actually be consistent with each other. So, uh, so we initialized a kind of, you can imagine, 201 million of agents, simulated agents, at the beginning by following from census data. And their age, gender, and race was, were actually determined by census data, following the same kind of uh, distributions. So then we used the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS, to actually obtain after-tax income, and then determine the amount of the money that they spent on the food. And it's, uh, the data that, it, that I will present today, all of them relate to lowest 13th percentile of the income because we were interested in low income individuals and the reason for that specific number was that it was meant to be also matching to other data sets that they actually use that specific percentile for low income individuals. And after actually uh, having annual income, we actually uh, calculated daily uh, amount of uh, money that goes toward food. And we also made sure that, because I mean, there are so many other considerations that I'm not going to cover today, but we made sure that it's a realistic number. Uh, for example, when it comes to food budget, we know that it usually includes for food at home, food away from home. Food away from home, when you go to a restaurant, that also includes tips, tax, and stuff like that. We made sure those items are excluded. It's only the money that goes, goes to our food only. So that was the money was assigned to each uh, simulated agent. Then for the price of the food, we actually used an existing uh, study by a group of uh, researchers from the University of Washington, uh, originally calculated from US Department of Agriculture back in the year 2001 the price of the main categories of the food, which I actually, which I introduce next. So here, uh, we also assign a total diet uh, energy, total amount of calorie intake or daily calorie intake for each individual uh, following their initial age, gender, and race. So we use uh, NHANES or National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey to determine the amount of total energy calorie that, that that specific individual will actually consume on average. For example, a person like me with the age and the gender that I have, uh, uh, it should be around 2200 calorie or kilocalorie per day. That's the way it works. And then in this type of models, the general assumption is that since it's a kind of a short period of simulation, the assumption is that the weight of the individuals do not change. So we also assume that the total energy intake is kind of fixed during the period of simulation. And then there is one big observation from the field, and that is exactly the same kind of method that all of different techniques in this area use. 
And that observation is that low-income individuals or humans in general are actually somehow optimizers. So if they cannot afford the so-called mean diet, uh, which basically mean diet is the average amount of uh, calorie or the, the average diet of the whole population, if they cannot afford that, they still try to be as close as possible to the mean diet. So that is the same assumption that, or that is the same observation that ha ha have been made in the field of nutrition. So, so in order to calculate mean diet, which basically, as I said, mean diet is the average amount of calorie obtained from the main categories of food. So these main categories of food were determined by USDA, US Department of Agriculture, uh, and I uh, calculated those numbers, uh, I only showing mean to you here, but also variation and other statistical measures, uh, using the enhanced data for 2001. So you can see nine main categories of food that we had, for example, fruits, veggies, the amount of calorie intake from each one of those categories, I calculated them from enhanced. So this is actually how it works in practice uh, to just give you a little more, more uh, f uh, kind of flavor of the technical part. So basically what happens, you can imagine three parallel simulations. In each one of those simulations, individuals use one of those price metrics. So I have 200 million simulated individuals who use price per calorie, another one for, that they use price per gram and price per serving. In each one of those simulations, they use this process. Every agent in each simulated day, this, they use this process for food decision making. At the beginning, their diet starts with being equal to mean diet. If they can afford the cost of that certain diet, initially mean diet, we are fine, the diet is set. If the cost of the diet is more expensive than what they can afford, which they calculate based on the price of the food, then they pick two random categories, uh, two random candidate categories, one for being increased, another one for being decreased, with a certain probability. And that probability is also determined by the mean diet number, both the probability of choosing the one for increasing and the one for decreasing, which I uh, can provide more detail how does it work, but uh, actually after picking two random categories for for candidate being increased and decreased, the agent actually checks to see if the one that is candidate for being increased is cheaper than the one for decrease. In each case of those three simulations, PPX is one of those price measures, PPC, PPG, or PPS, price per calorie, price per gram, and price per serving. And if that's the case, the agent actually updates the diet by increasing the amount of calorie from that one that is a candidate for increasing with a little amount and decreasing the adult, another one with the same amount. So the idea is not that kind of complicated. So the, idea, the idea is simple. So imagine that I am an agent that uses price per calorie and I cannot afford this, set of, this type of diet. A possibility might be that I will consume more bread because it's uh, cheaper, less meat because uh, it's more expensive in terms of price per calorie, right? That's the same idea that uh, we were actually trying to implement in practice. So then this loop actually continues until the cost is lower than the budget and then we have the diet is set. But probably what is more important than this kind of technical part or nuts and bolts of it is kind of the ability to actually simplify the complexity. So remember, we want to actually simulate population level uh, behavior of the individuals across the US population for food decision making. And we can treat each one of them separately, have, th have them decide about their food uh, completely independently with these simple rules, and yet again have those kind of similar patterns somehow emerge at the population level. So one thing that is important to note is that when you use mean diet, in this case, for assigning, for choosing the categories, uh, for assigning the probabilities of choosing those categories, you are indirectly also considering uh, other factors that actually affect a food intake behavior. Because it's not only the price that affects food behavior or food decision making. Uh, when you use mean diet, the idea is that all of other uh, factors like taste, convenience, and health 
have already contributed to those numbers across the population because all of them have already contributed to the mean diet. So when you follow mean diet for assigning probabilities of choosing a certain category, you are indirectly also considering all those factors as well. So, uh, so by now, I have three simulations, three simulations that in each one of them, individuals use price per calorie, price per gram, and price per serving. Now, I can go ahead and compare it against actual data. And in this case, I uh, uh, use data from three different sources. Uh, I'm going to cover the beginning two. The idea is kind of simpler for the whole of them. So the third one was actually comparing income elasticity of demand from my model, comparing that against the data, actual data from World Bank. As you, might, as you know, income elasticity of demand is that if you increase the amount of income of the people by, for example, one person, how much their <coughs> consumption of a certain good will actually change. We calculated that from simulation, again, compared it against actual data. So if you, I present the first part of the comparisons, so this is actually the amount of calorie intake from those nine main categories of food. You can see nine charts here. The gray bars here shows the actual data from the NHANES 2001. And these are average amount of calorie intake from each of those main categories. So the gray, green bars show the simulated uh, results using any of those price metrics. So being closer, so being closer to uh, gray bar is better. For example, in this case, price per calorie was closer. And again, we actually did the same experiment uh, using something called Healthy Eating Index, or HEI score. Uh, many of you are certainly familiar. The, in 2001, the way that they were actually defining that was that it is a score from 0 to 10 if you are consuming, I mean, just it, Put it simply, uh, if you are consuming close to recommended guidelines of each of the categories, for example, enough amount of vegetable in a day, your score for that year, HEI score, would be equal to 10. If you consume less of that, the score will be different. So we calculated those numbers by following each of those actually price metrics and compared it against actual data from one that was originally calculated from NHANES. These data were actually reported by USDA, US Department of Agriculture. Compared them for five categories, and the reason the remaining four are not shown, it was that the remaining four was not also reported in the original data. We compared them again here, being closer to uh, gray bar is better. That demonstrates being closer to actual data. So by now, I have all different comparisons between modeled uh, data, actual data, and I want to have a measure to combine all those numbers in a kind of unique uh, representative way. So I used three different measures, residual sum of scores, sum of absolute differences, and Akaiki information criterion, which basically their job is to combine the differences between two distributions, two ty type of data, uh, model data and actual data in this case. If I focus only on one of them, uh, in this case, Akaiki Information Criterion, or AIC, uh, in this case, lower or more negative is better. And in the case of the first experiment, uh, we observed that uh, when individuals were using PPC, or price per calorie, the, the, their pattern were much closer to reality compared to price per gram and price per serving. And we observed this pattern over and over again across all different experiments, all different measures that we used. And we observed that price per calorie is significantly closer to uh, real, real uh, patterns of uh, food consumption. And based on that, uh, our conclusion was that it might be the case that for low-income individuals, price per calorie is the primary me metric that they use for food decision making. And uh, I think I somehow mentioned it at the beginning, but this is kind of a long lasting uh, problem. And you, if you see uh, papers in this area, it's, they are very interesting. Some of them, uh, there is a one main paper, there are 20 responses to editors that people argue differently about how they calculated them. But there are some challenges. One of the classic challenges that exist is that people argue that 
because generally the way that people, uh, researchers try to answer this question of which price metric individuals use is by analyzing food consumption data, food consumption pattern data. And people have argued there is an inherent problem because there is a correlation between energy cost or dollar over calorie and energy density or calorie over gram. Because of this inherent correlation, you cannot analyze food consumption data. But what we, do, what we did was that we avoided this whole challenge because we did not analyze food consumption data. We let that food consumption data emerge, and then we actually conclude based on the emergent food consumption patterns. So, I mean, obviously, the, there are limitations about this model in practice. There might be a combination of different uh, price metrics for uh, specifically different price uh, categories that people might be using. But uh, still, we believe that the dominant one or model shows that is still price per calorie that is closest to the reality. And everyone knows that when it comes to these studies, we cannot rely too much on self-reported data. The curse of self-reported data also exists here. Relying too much on enhanced type of data is not uh, uh, quite safe. We know those limitations, but it's also important to uh, talk about uh, implications and note about note the implications. It might be actually the uh, price per calorie of the food that, at the policy making level, uh, uh, in the, uh, people have to actually focus, and it might be the real barrier on the price per calorie of the food that people have to actually consider for designing their intervention in this field. And uh, so I also wanted to uh, kind of very quickly mention a kind of funny story that happened when I, for the first time, presented this work in one of the national meetings. And it was kind of the time that I was quite young and junior to the whole field. I was so confident about my fundings, so proud. I went ahead of, uh, in, in a room of like, as several hundred uh, senior individuals in the, in the room. And, and, and actually, I was a third presenter. And I didn't pay enough attention to the previous two. And I was the third one. I presented my work so, so, actually so much excited about it. And there was so much discussion about it, so many questions. And I felt something doesn't seem quite normal, especially for a kind of junior person like me here. But I said, fine, I mean, people care about it. That's great. And then after the meeting, a friend of mine came back and told me, look, did you notice the first person, a senior person, they designed an intervention in Mexico, they used price per serving. The second person, they used price per gram. You came, you went there and said, you have to use price per calorie, which the first lesson was that you have to actually listen to the previous presentations uh, for me. But my point of saying that was that it had a clear impact on the way that you design intervention in the real field to know which price metric individuals use. And by the way, for example, US Department of Agriculture in the reports that they have, they generally use price per serving for the, the programs they actually design. So uh, going to another project, uh, we, I actually beginning from the second year of my postdoc, I was uh, uh, starting to actually looking another factor of food decision making in this time palatability of the food and I started working uh, and you can see that the nature of this factor is very different from those kind of behavioral measures like price of the food or uh, social network effect of on the food decision making we started with uh, working on animal data and uh, so there are so much more details about this, but basically I presented a mathematical model that was able to predict the amount of total calorie intake of rat, daily calorie intake of rat, based on the energy density, or E, that the diet that is given to the animal, the body weight of the animal, or and time and duration of the uh, period that the food is given to, that, to the animal. So basically the idea is that, and there is a parameter, a row here, which is, a specific to, which is a specific to each rat. So basically the idea is that this energy density, E, is the main determinant of palatability of the food. And this model is somehow indirectly able to predict the amount of calorie intake of rats uh, as a function of their energy density 
uh, of the diet given to them. So for actually training this row parameter, we used the data from chow diet uh, and tested that on high energy diet. So I'm showing you some set of uh, comparisons here. So you can see eight of those rats here, eight uh, charts here showing, if I only focus on one of them here on top left, so the horizontal line here shows model calorie intake. This is actual calorie intake. What you would expect is that being closer to diagonal line is better. That sh shows the greater match. And each circle here uh, corresponds to one day of calorie intake. So we had uh, about 40 days of uh, data. So each circle is one day of calorie intake. And you can see that we were able to actually simulate quite uh, close to reality type of behaviors for the rats. But when it comes to this type of applications, this type of models, it's also clear that it's not only about validating the model, it's also about biological relevance and biological meaning. So we also had other ways to make sure that is the case. For example, uh, I'm not going to go to that much of details, but this uh, equation itself is based on the equations that originally were proposed by other researchers uh, based on uh, actually calculating the amount of calorie intake for the animals uh, in a leaking rate type of scenario when they leak a liquid uh, type of food given to them. So that was the case also for this project. And we are working right now on the extension of this work so uh, the, the group that I am working, they work on uh, kind of injecting leptin into brain of these rats. And we are working on uh, understanding how much leptin sensitivity of, of each rat can, might be able to predict their food intake behaviors when a high fat diet or high energy diet is given to them. So that's another data set that we are working right now. But uh, starting from the previous year, I had the opportunity to also work in a kind of quite exciting area uh, working on humans. And I guess when it comes to decision making, health behavior, uh, it's kind of, there is no way of avoiding the most important organ of your body in decision making, which is brain. And based on that, uh, there is a project that I am working to analyze neuroimaging data. Uh, specifically, I'm looking at two modalities, a functional MRI and PET scan and to design models that can describe the uh, role of uh, two of main neurotransmitters in the brain, specifically dopamine and opioid peptides. And I can give you more details about it because we, I think we had a kind of relatively good progress so far. And the idea is that we want to actually create a mathematical model, if you will, that can describe the role of the, these two neurotransmitters to determine the food intake patterns of the individuals. And this is actually uh, what I am planning to talk about it tomorrow in the next presentation that I will have. Uh, but uh, uh, I think when it comes to any type of data analytical method nowadays, similar to not being able to avoid brain, there is no way of avoiding deep learning type of methods. So that's kind of the technique that we are using to actually train and develop the mathematical model that I mentioned. And basically, this is the same idea that I used to uh, submit a recent K to NIH, uh, or better to say, uh, resubmitted that recently. Basically, the idea is that to understand, to develop models that describe this food decision-making behaviors. So I think for this type of audience, I can probably skip most of this, but I think one thing that is clear is that uh, obesity is a big issue. And if there is one pattern, only one pattern that we can observe from this chart, a recent report by CDC, that is that the obesity rate and prevalence is, con is continuing to grow. And that has real implications, real meaning to human's life. And I think for many of us that are working in the area of health biomedicine, we have a strong personal reasons one of them being myself. I had a family member who was suffering and still suffering from diabetes as a result of obesity. Uh, we all know that there is 
much work that have been done by so many great researchers, but there is a lot more that can be done in the area of obesity. And I think when it comes to the type of problems, to the, the type of way, the, the way that I look at this problem, many of the techniques are also applicable to other areas in the, in the area of addictive or compulsive behaviors. And because, I mean, the roots of these behaviors in so many ways are quite uh, comparable to each other. And I think one of the probably uh, examples that everyone, I'm sure, is kind of quite concerned at this point is opioid epidemic. This is a big concern for many of us, and we kind of want to have, have a way of contributing to this whole area. Uh, but I also wanted to mention very briefly that uh, I think it's kind of clear that the future of the health and medicine is somehow related and determined by precision medicine and precision health. And I see the techniques that I have been presenting so far and I have been using as a kind of very well matched to this type of uh, kind of area because when uh, the idea in the precision medicine and precision health is that you, we are actually trying to treat each individual differently to actually receive a certain drug or certain uh, intervention based on their own characteristics, right? Uh, being genetics, being environment. So this is kind of very similar to type of techniques that I have been using to, and kind of, you can imagine that in a simulated world, but still each individual agent is quite separate, different from the one next to it in a kind of neighborhood, another neighborhood or another family member. So I think there is great potential in this area and uh, in addition to uh, doing research in this area, I was also teaching similar topics. And there is a kind of a unique opportunity that I had. You can actually check it out online. There is a MOOC course on Coursera titled System Science and Obesity. I was one of the co-instructors of that course and kind of offering similar topics in, at Hopkins uh, to uh, students uh, without any programming or coding background. This was, I would say, probably more instructive to me than the students that I had because it was a learning curve for me to actually understand that uh, the, what are the best ways to do that in practice. So to just wrap everything up, uh, I want to emphasize once again that we have the opportunity to significantly expand what is known about health behavior and the processes that lead to uh, decision-making process that lead to this type of health behaviors specifically computational methods that are able to combine different factors, different data sets that uh, represent different uh, factors that uh, contribute to these health behaviors, have the potential to uh, contribute to this field and actually enable us to have a better understanding of these uh, health behaviors. And to just uh, make it con making that connected to the way I introduced, int uh, started, it's great that we are making uh, big dogs, uh, great robots, uh, autonomous cars, Falcon 9s, but we also need to spend much, much more time and energy on using these computational techniques on uh, important uh, problems in the area of health. And with that, I just want to conclude, and thank you very much. Well, that's a good question. I mean, and the simple answer to that is that, I mean, the model at this point is much more simpler than being able to consider anything in terms of 
uh, zero calorie type of sweeteners and that type of things. So the idea is that actually we want to specifically have study the type of foods that uh, the amount of calorie that you will consume is kind of consistent with the, the taste that you actually uh, uh, feel from consuming the food. Uh, but I think that's a very good extension to this work. I'm trying to think how that can be done. So because right now, uh, the assumption here is that when an animal consumes that food, the amount of calorie that is perceived by the animal is exactly the same that is the one that is being consumed. And I completely understand the whole area of palatability is much more complicated than I'm talking about. Uh, it goes to color of the food, uh, uh, taste of the food, oral sensory, kind of differentiating between liking, wanting, but that's kind of just kind of a one step toward that goal. So that's, that's not that's probably one extension to kind of in the future work. Sure. Um, so thank you for your presentation, uh, very stimulating. Uh, so, you know, so one of the interesting distinctions between uh, some drugs of dependence and, and, and food with, among by those of the beast is one presumes that with food that there's some sort of society mechanism, right? There's some basis where people say, I'm, I'm stopping eating, right? And with drugs, um, those mechanisms may not be operative, and that may be part of the, the reason. How would you model uh, uh, society versus the absence of society in these type of models to understand individual behavior? Sure. So, so if I kind of want to answer it specifically in a kind of technical way. So we know that actually what happens is that, I mean, I don't want to get to the whole area. I really feel scared to saying that, but to the area of food addiction and that type of kind of controversial issues. But one way of actually looking at that is that, for example, when I have a simulated person, simulated agent, I mean, one way is that I know, for example, the total energy intake that they will consume on a daily basis, this is usually brought by average number from, for example, NHANES. And then one way of doing that is that uh, to, to kind of creating a variation. And interestingly, that variation is so small, and some people argue that it doesn't show anything in the kind of uh, short term. For example, it kind of even in the kind of people who actually have high BMI and have kind of difficulty to kind of control their food intake, they actually, even for them, the amount of tolerance in a daily basis is about, like, uh, about less than 100 kilocalories. So one way is that actually to uh, differentiate between the amount of uh, calorie that based on your homeostatistical need you will need to consume that's one uh, number that I can calculate it based on kind of quite rigorous mathematical models that exist. Uh, you usually you put, I, I'm sure you are aware, uh, you usually put weight, height, and different conditions, you get a number. That's one number that my body uh, needs, and there is another number that you, you need to actually uh, model for the one that is determined by the food that you will consume. So one way of doing that is that kind of having a variation based on different factors that they encounter. So uh, I mean that also goes back to having different factors. So if there is a palatability of the food, if there is the social connections. So for example, one way of doing that is that if the person is consuming the food in an environment within a family or in a kind of restaurant, then their food intake would be X percent higher on average than their normal. So if they are in this in situation, if they are consuming a kind of food that has this amount of calorie, and usually what happens is that you bring those numbers from literature. So you look around, for example, there are clinical work, uh, like other field studies, you see that, for example, on average, people report that this amount, if you consume this type of food or in this setting, 
you, your uh, food intake will increase by this amount. So that's one way of actually showing that in the model as well. And with, uh, if you're applying that to drugs where there may not be such um, information, how, how would you approach that? So you may not know the number of milligrams of opioids that opioid addicts use. Hmm. But if you wanted to um, try to model of their consumption, how would you Well, I think, but still, there has to be a way to determine that, for example, I mean, on average, how many times they might actually consume a certain drug if the dosage is not quite clear. But I assume, I mean, you might actually correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume that there is a way to determine the kind of on average, for example, if this person have this type of demographics, if it has this set of attributes in this environment, then there is this probability that they will uh, actually consume this amount of drug. Don't we have such an information from the literature? Well, I think my approach, my way of thinking is that I usually look for a kind of probabilistic a probability that gives me kind of uh, a number, and that's the, generally what I do. I look around in the literature to just see, okay, there is, this is the probability that this person uh, or this studied pace person uh, might actually consume drug or something like that. And one thing important is that so many of these uh, models are population level models. So it's true that at the kind of if you take one of them, they, they might not be quite realistic, but at the collective, at the kind of population level, when you have like 30 million individuals simulated, you have enough diversity that what you are looking for in reality also emerge and you will have it. Specifically, for example, in this case, uh, uh, people have argued that uh, obviously people have different preferences across different diets, different cultural differences in the U.S., but one thing about, for example, a so, such a large population is that you have enough diversity that when you kind of simulate the whole thing, those actually kind of mirror in the model, kind of happen naturally. I see. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Sure. Uh, again, this was really very broad ranging, really fascinating topics. One question that I'm struggling with, and in part, it goes to something that Warren had just suggested about the overlap between the, the standard typical satiety approach uh, in eating and in addictions to opioids or others. And one of the things we struggle with is the transition from, if you will, people being able to follow a prescription for a low dose of medication and a point where they become indeed addicted and start abusing. So is there a parallel that you would see in the modeling, almost you know, a, a discontinuity between people blowing through satiety as the driving factor for obesity and going past appropriate prescribing limitations and becoming addicted? If we can come up with a model that allows for prediction of a discontinuity point where there is a risk threshold, would you see that as something either achievable or of theoretical interest? Sure. Well, let me just give you one concrete example. So I didn't have time to talk about it. But for example, in this case, so one other kind of interesting thing that we discussed in the, one of the publications was that, so if you remember this row parameter is a specific to each animal. So, and we actually kind of show that this row parameter can be in direct measure of uh, calculating so-called reward sensitivity. So, and I think they are so common that you, you kind of study this type of problem in the kind of reinforcement learning type of uh, approach. And one thing that can be done is that, uh, I mean, the idea originally was that when we have this number, this parameter, 
this is a specific to each animal and kind of looking at that in a kind of translational way, also applicable to humans, if we can come up with also parameter, which is kind of specific to each individual, probably very similar to uh, discount uh, learning rate that uh, I know Dr. Bickel is very interested. So if we can calculate that number, that might be actually a good way of kind of uh, showing the probability or the chance of people going above their actually actual usage or what they actually need or in kind of this case of the drug usage. So that's one thing that I can concretely specific, uh, mention here. So, and I think similar methods can be also applied to differentiate between uh, as we call satiety, that is meant mostly by what you need based on your physiological properties and what you end up using based on hedonic or rewarding factors of consuming a food or drug. So that's one idea that comes to my mind that I think is applicable to that, the other areas that you mentioned. Sure. I think our time is up. Uh, please uh, join us.